Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Ramel London, and welcome to the Smart City Expo World Congress in Barcelona. Now, our next keynote speaker is a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, awarded in 2016, Mr. and Professor Mohamed Yunus. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> His most recent book is entitled is titled A World of Free Zeros, The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, and Zero Net Carbon. Professor Mohamed Yunus is the father of both social business and microcredit, the founder of Grameen Bank, and also many other more businesses, up to 50 other companies in Bangladesh. Capitalism as it is now, practice recognizes only one goal, the selfish pursuit of individual profit. Only businesses designed around the goal and recognize, are recognized and supported. Elimination of poverty, unemployment, and environmental degradation can be dramatically reduced by running social businesses. So please welcome Professor Mohamed Yunus. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Well, I'm delighted to get a chance to brief you on what I have been doing. And uh, the word microcredit probably is familiar with many people. It was something done accidentally. It's not pre-planned or anything like that. I was trying to protect some lo victims of loan sharks in the village next door to the university where I was teaching. And in order to do that, to protect the victims, the idea that I had, why don't I lend the money myself? If I lend the money, they don't have to go to loan shark. The problem is solved. I don't have to write a big thesis about it. Just go ahead and do it. And it's a very simple thing. Took the money from my pocket and started giving money. Anybody who needs money, come to me. Don't go to the loan shark. And that's how it began back in 1976. I had no idea that it will spill over to the next village or the next village. But it became very popular. It kept on expanding and expanding. That at one point, I thought, I cannot handle it anymore by myself with my students with me. Why don't I create an institution, a banking institution, to create a bank for the poor people? Everybody laughed. Lending money to the poor people is a strange. Now you're talking about bank for, a poor, for poor people. But I didn't give up. And finally, in 1983, we got all the clearances and so on, created a bank called Grameen Bank, and continued doing that. It became very popular within the country, outside the country. The word was coined to explain what we do. It's called microcredit, tiny loans. That word didn't exist in English literature. So they had to coin a word to describe what we do. People keep asking me, how did you design the whole bank that it works for the poor people? The whole world saying it cannot work. And you are insisting that it will work. I said that, you know, best thing that happened to me in doing this, I never studied banking. I never took a course in banking. So I could do anything I want. So nobody is in the back of my mind telling you, you have to do this, you have to do that. I didn't follow any of those rules. I defied all those rules. To the extent I keep saying that, well, you know, the, the reason it works, I didn't know the rules. So I look at the rules what the banks, conventional banks follow. Each time I look at their rules to see if I, what I have to do. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. And it worked. They go to the rich, I go to the poor. They go to men, I go to women. They do it to city center, I go to the remote village. They ask for collateral. I said, forget about collateral. No collateral. If you're dealing with the poor people, collateral doesn't help. It's a wall. So the entire system is based not on collateral at all. It's a mutual trust, if, if you have to explain anything like that. Conventional banks are owned by rich people. 
If you own a bank, you have to be a very rich person. We created a bank which is owned by poor people. Not only poor people, poor women. We focus on women. Today in Bangladesh, Grameen Bank, the bank we created, has more than 9 million borrowers. Almost all of them are women. 97% are women. Destitute women, illiterate women, the women who never cross the boundary of our village. That's the woman. And it worked. And it is uh, copied around the world. It's discussed in many ways. Uh, we were invited to do it in the United States because they are saying we, this doesn't work in the United States. I said, why? How come? Maybe you're not doing it the right way. They said, why didn't you come and show us? So I decided to do that. I created a bank, or a, not a bank actually, an organization, Jamin America. Started in Jackson Heights, New York, in Queens, in 2008, January, beginning. And came out a beautiful branch of Grameen. And then everybody wanted to Grameen branch in their neighborhood. We want um, one, another one in our borough. You want another one in your borough. So now we have seven branches in New York City. And other cities keep coming that I, we want our, in our city, our poor are worse than New York poor. So we said, OK. So we have now 22 branches in 14 cities of the United States. In total, there are more than 100,000 borrowers in all this together in the 10 years. All women, 100% women. The maximum loan amount that you can get in your first loan, a startup loan, is under $1,500. So you can imagine how desperate one has to be to work hard to get to that $1,500. And not all of them are $1,500, some of them are $700, some of them are $800, and so on. But in total, we have given over a billion dollar loan in the United States with perfect repayment in every single branch in every single city, near 100%, always over 99.5%. No collateral, nothing, as we follow the same rules and procedure. We keep claiming always from the beginning, I said, Grameen Bank is the only bank in the world which is lawyer free. No lawyer in our system because we don't need them. You need lawyer when you have to tie them up with their properties and things like that. We have nothing to tie them up. Of the 100%, sorry, 100,000 borrowers that we have in the United States, 60% of them are undocumented women. Imagine that. Not only women, undocumented. Nobody wants to go anywhere near them. They can be thrown out any time, particularly with Trump in the White House. You don't know when they're going to throw thrown out. And these are the people that we gave in total a billion dollars, and they pay me back every single penny. People ask me why there is poverty. What is the reason? You have been working with poor people. I say it's very simple. Poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we build around us. It is not created by the persons who are poor. It is imposed phenomenon on those persons. Something came from externally. I tried to explain it by saying it's like a bonsai. You know the bonsai tree? You take the seed of a very tall tree and put it in a flower pot. It grows only this big. It doesn't grow big. And you wonder what happened. Very simple explanation. You didn't give enough soil to grow. So it grew only to the extent of you provided the soil. Poor people, to me, are bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seed. Simply, society never gave them the space to grow as tall as anybody could be. And I put it this way. I said financial services like loans, insurances, and many other things, these are like financial oxygen to people. Like if you don't have oxygen in this room, we cannot breathe. Soon we'll all collapse. If you don't have the financial oxygen to people, economically people cannot breathe, cannot function. They become dysfunctional. And we call them poor people. It's not their fault. Simply, you didn't give them the oxygen. The moment you connect them with oxygen, they become alive, active, creative, like anybody else. 
That's what happens of the millions of millions of women who took loans from Grameen and other such program to change their life. I confront this issue again and again. How come we cannot get rid of poverty if that's so? I said, because you're not changing the institution. After 42 years of microcredit, with all those good things you talk about, microcredit, Grameen Bank, you even gave a Nobel Peace Prize for that. But the financial system doesn't change. Banks don't change. I said the existing banks are actually bank for the rich. But we don't say that. We just call them banks. Whenever somebody introduces me, they say he's a banker to the poor. I said, that's great. But would you say that to the other guy who runs other kind of bank? He's a banker to the rich. You don't say that. So that remains hidden. The fact that it remains hidden, we are not aware of it. If we call them banker to the rich or bank for the rich, everybody will say, where is the bank for the poor? Bank for the poor doesn't exist. And that's the trouble we have. And that's not only that, the whole system that we built works only for the people privileged. It doesn't work for the people at the bottom. And that continues. Today, all the wealth of the world is getting concentrated and concentrated and fewer and fewer hands. Everybody knows that. But we don't talk about it. We are told again and again this year that eight people in the world own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population of the world. Eight, sorry, four billion people's worth put together equals to the wealth of eight persons. And we know those eight persons. They're our friends. They're good people. Warren Buffet, Mac, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, you name them. And we'd love to take selfie with them. No problem. But that's the way wealth goes. If you look globally, 99% of the wealth belongs to 1% of the population of the entire world. In other words, 99% of the population of the world gets only 1% of the wealth of the world. And where do this 1% of the population live? Probably half a dozen countries, maybe seven countries, eight countries. That's where all these 1% people live. So all the wealth of the world is concentrated in their hands. What happens to the rest of the world, rest of the countries? They have to be satisfied with 1% of the total wealth of the entire world. What I keep reminding people, if this is true, if you are convinced this is true, this has been repeated many times, then this is a ticking time bomb. The whole world will explode in anger, in dissatisfaction, politically, economically, you name it. You see expressions of such anger in, in the politics of many countries already. And that's what I've been trying to talk about in the book that I just but this is the reason I'm here. It's called A World of Three Zeros. Just came out the Spanish version. The English version was published before. World of Three Zeros, zero poverty, zero unemployment, zero net carbon emission. And we can create that is world. Why can't we do it now? Because we cannot do it, our system is wrong. I keep repeating, if we follow the old roads, we always end up with the old destination. Old destination is poverty. Old destination is environmental degradation. Old destination is unemployment. So if you want to get out of it, a new destination, we have to build new roads. Old roads will never take you to a new destination. If you want, if you have something in your mind as a new destination, this is where we want to go. And it will have to be built, roads have to be built new. What I was trying to do, like I did microcredit unknowingly, accidentally, but it needed by the people. When I was working with them, I saw many other problems with the poor people, not just financial services. Healthcare, water, sanitation, housing, you name it. So every time I look at those problems very closely, because I'm very close with them every day, I wanted to be somehow involved in it, helping them to solve it. 
I could solve it in a charity way. I give some, bring some money, raise some funds, build a few houses, bring some money, have a health clinic. We all do that in our foundation, in the RNG activity. I didn't take that path. What I did, every time I see a problem, I create a business to solve it. Sounds very funny, but that's what I did. I created one after another, business after business. And these are businesses having strange some features. People identified that I'm doing it some strange business. Strange because I don't want to make money out of it. Because the core cornerstone of a business is to make money. The more money you make, more successful you are. Here I'm saying I don't want to make money. I want to solve problem in a business way. Charity is a wonderful thing. Charity money goes out, does a wonderful thing. But money doesn't come back. I said, this is not a good idea for me. Why don't I create a business and I had no intention of making money out of it so it becomes more powerful and address the problem. And I call it social business. Non-dividend company to solve human problems. And I started creating one after another. So while charity money goes out, doesn't come back, social business money goes out, solves the problem, and money comes back because it's a business. Then you use it the money again, and money comes back. You use the money again. So social business money has endless life. So it becomes very powerful. This is what I did. I created many, many companies. I have narrated this in the book. One just quick example, energy. Again, I became kind of upset that there is no electricity in the villages of Bangladesh. It's all dark after sun goes down. I said, my God, after all these years, still we have to live in a cave age. Why can't we do something about electricity? So one idea came, why don't we bring solar energy? So I created a company for solar energy to bring solar home system in every home. In the beginning, they said, no, no we, don't, we don't know whether this is going to work. Why should we pay? Then I gave them a challenge. I said, how much money you spend on kerosene? Because after all, you are using kerosene. How much money every month you spend? They say, well, I spend so much, I spend so much. I said, give me the kerosene money every month. I give you electricity. They thought this is a good idea. So I said, okay, it's a good idea. I give you electricity. If you don't like it, you return it. You don't have to pay me anything. And people loved it. And it became very popular. Today, we have more than 4 million homes in Bangladesh with solar home system. And it keeps growing. And we created the company not to make money, to solve the problem so that we can bring electricity. The moment you bring electricity, everything opens up. You get electric, you have television, you have phone, internet, whatever you say, because everybody has electricity. So this is one example of social business. And we continued, and many big companies became interested in us. So we are saying, why people don't do that? I said, the economic system is, went on a wrong path the one capitalist system that we talk about, because they interpreted human being in a very narrow way. They interpreted human being as someone who is driven by self-interest. That's the core of a capitalist system. Human being driven by self-interest. In other words, entire economic system is run by selfish interest. So we became selfish because we believe in it. I said, capitalist system has put on glasses on our eyes with dollar sign or the euro sign. We don't see anything else. I said, what I'm trying to do is to bring bifocal glasses. You have dollar sign, you also have people sign. That's the social business. I say, real human being is both selfish and selfless. If you only accept that, then you have two kinds of business. Selfish business, we all do. Selfless business, we don't do, because it doesn't Stay in, is not included in our textbook. This is not taught on our class, it's not our business school. That's the problem. We have it, but you don't use it. So if you use it, if you have all social businesses around the world, there will be no wealth concentration. It will be done. And wealth con social business is not to be done by the government. It's us, you and me. We do the social business and money-making business at the same time. Every company that you have, can create a social business on the side. Already many companies have done that. I have illustrated that because don't have much time. 
And then something, I got involved in another thing. Many of the young people, the Grameen families, they have education because we give them education loan. They have good degrees, but no jobs in Bangladesh. And they complain. I said, why are you complaining? Why are you looking for a job in the first place? I said, job is an obsolete idea. It is something misinterpreted, misintroduced by capitalist system. You have to work for somebody from the capitalist guy. You don't have to work for anybody. Human beings are not born in this planet to work for anybody. They get very puzzled. <laughs> what kind of game is that? I said, look at your mother. Your mother joined Grameen Bank 20 years back. She's an illiterate woman. She mustered all her courage to take a $20, $25 loan to start a business. If your illiterate mother can become an interpreter, uh, entrepreneur by $25 loan, what's wrong with you? You know what's wrong with you? Your mother is a natural human being, like the way we were in this planet thousands of years back. She tried to address her problem, and she knew what to do, exactly what to do. She didn't worry about it. She had the courage to do that and got it done and gradually moved up. You became an artificial human being, I'm telling the son or the daughter, because you went to school. Your school converted into an artificial human being. All you see, your life is about taking a job. Job is not a destiny of a human being. I said human beings are born as entrepreneurs. So we should be entrepreneurs. So we tell them, go back to your mother and learn the things you have learned and be a natural human being again. Come back to us, come with a business idea. We'll invest in your business. We created a venture capital fund, social business venture capital fund. We become your investor. We become your partner. You make it successful, return the money. We are not interested in your profit because we are social business. We are a non-dividend company. So keep the profit and move on. Our job is to solve your problem so that you can be in, the, in your orbit. So now, thousands and thousands of young people come with the business ideas. We keep on investing. And right now, we have more than 1,000 young people per month that we invest. More, many more thousands apply, but gradually, they keep getting it. Nobody is rejected. Nobody is rejected. Nobody is abandoned. So if everybody can become an entrepreneur, why do we have so much unemployment in the world? Even in Italy, they have 40% unemployment. South of Italy, they tell me there's 60% unemployment. I was introduced to Napoli by Mario. And he says, this is my problem. I said, you are looking for the wrong solution, trying to look for job. Job is not the solution. Job is an artificial solution. Human beings are entrepreneur. So now we are setting up social business fund there as we do to create that. Kosovo, we have introduced something, similar thing in Kosovo, so the young people in Kosovo can become entrepreneur by doing that. So this is another one. Capitalist system has directed in a wrong direction. So if we adopt this new rules or a new way, this is nothing, as, as I said, this is nothing imposed on you. These are options to, for every children, every child, that you can be an entrepreneur or job seeker. But you can tell I'm not a job seeker, then I'm a job creator, then become an entrepreneur. That's up to you. But a school has to tell them. Today, schools tell us that our school produces job-ready young people. What a shame. Human beings are not robots. That you produce those robots to fit into the slots of the jobs. I keep telling young people, look, each human being has unlimited creative capacity. They can do anything they want. But job takes away all your creativity. Job is something which the only thing you have to do is to satisfy your boss. No creativity is needed. That's a routine work that you do. So you surrender your creativity. Why option? take options? Choose your thing. Now, last point. If all people really became entrepreneurs in the world, will there be wealth concentration? No. Because we'll, each of us will be picking up the wealth ourselves. We are the entrepreneurs. The rich people, the richest people, super rich, can get all the wealth because we work for them. We are the mercenaries for them. We work for them and they make the money. They don't work. So why should we continue that process? 
Why can't we do it something that we share with everybody else? So that's the point that I want to, to, I want to I want I raised in the book that we need to build these new roads so that we can build this new world that we want where there'll be no poverty, no unemployment. I keep repeating, unemployment is created through the concept of employment. If we didn't have the concept of employment, there'll be no unemployment because we'll be doing our own thing. And zero net carbon emission, which everybody is familiar with, but urgency is not realized. We have only 30 years to go to save the planet. 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature by 2040. That is the time limit. Or if it's a worst case scenario, it is one, two, point, uh, two degrees Celsius by 2050, which is 30 years from now. After that, we are in a point of no return. So whichever direction you see, you are up for trouble, up for extinction. So we, unless we get out and make sure this society doesn't explode because of wealth concentration, it doesn't dysfunctional, burned out planet by the 200, 2050, we have to get the action going right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mohammed Yunus. Right, we now have an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Um, you can see that there are microphones on the sides of the aisles. So if you would like to ask a question, please do come forward. If not, I've got a few questions that were sent in to us as well. So I'll give you a few moments. Do you have a question? I think she has a question. <laughs> Just take the microphone, thank you. Hello, Guy Arzilli. Thank you very much for the inspirational speech, but I have a very tricky question. <laughs> I love the idea that everyone should go out there and pursue their own passion, but I have to ask you, how are you able to finance yourself to provide finance to others? Seems pretty yeah. simple. We have companies which make money, but since we don't, don't take any dividend, this money used to create more companies. So that's how we got the money. Pardon me? You personally. Oh, you, my person. <laughs> I started uh, lending money out of my own pocket, whatever income I had. I used to teach in the USA long back. So I came back from the US, so I had lots of money with me. So that's the money I used to start the initial. It didn't need a lot of money, it's a small loan. $10, $20, $50, that's about it. So that's the initial part. Then. We turned into a bank. After we became a bank, you don't need any money from outside. You just take deposits from the depositors. It used the depositors' money to lend money. Grameen Bank, which lends out billions of dollars each year, even as tiny loans, it all comes from the depositors' money. All our the finance, uh, the money, we have the problem of excess money rather than shortage of money. There's so much deposits coming to bank. Uh, I mean, bank, we have to expand ourselves to absorb this so that we can lend out more and more money to people because there's so much unutilized money. So we never had any problem of uh, shortage of money. So this is one. And many other programs started similarly. We have companies who earn money, which we use for lending money to the young people or investing money in the young people as, as they created the venture capital fund. In a different way, venture capital always indicates that you want to make more money from your partner. But here it's the reverse. We don't want to make money from our partner. All the money, all the profit belongs to him or her. So we do that. So this is how we do, keep on doing this. And then we create over, now that it started expanding, we have created social business funds in many countries. We have two social business funds in um, India, social business funds in Uganda, Kenya, Brazil, and many other countries. People who invested in this for social business, knowing fully well that they will not get any dividend. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Uh, my name is Gustavo Ribeiro from Copenhagen. Thank you for a uh, wonderful presentation and uh, uh, very inspiring work. And uh, my question is, uh, 
some of the people who are uh, uh, who have the uh, the business loan, and uh, some of them they are successful, but others are not successful. How do you cope with that? Yeah, again, this is a part of our business. I briefly mentioned. Probably you can catch it when we invite young people to come with business ideas. Our rules we explain to them. Nobody will be rejected, no matter how lousy your business plan is, you will not be rejected. Simply, you will be invited to work with us to improve your business plan. And one time, first round, second round, third round, then you made it. Then we invest in your business. And the second rule is nobody will be abundant, meaning that you fail to be successful. I said business means 50-50 chance. You may be successful, you may be failure. So don't be afraid of that. It's part of life in business. So if you're Failure will not blame you for that. <coughs> this is part of life. So we said, okay, we'll start all over again. Would you like to continue with the same one? Would you like to start a new one? So we'll be with you until you're successful. <coughs> and that way, we'll, we're not forgiving any money. We're not forfeiting any money. But gradually, we'll make you so successful, you'll be returning all the money that you took in the first place. So it will be done, finished. And since we are not making any profit out of it, it's just the core money that I gave you, and you're sending it, giving it back, it's not a heavy burden on them. So this is how we worked it out. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, just go ahead. You know, unfortunately, we only have room for two more questions, and these ladies are here first. Sorry, gentlemen. So you next, please. Uh, thank you for this. My name is Olga Shepelianska, and I work on climate resilience in Asian cities. Uh, thank you very much for a very thank inspirational you. speech. And uh, my question is related to my field of expertise and to the region, which you are very familiar with coming from there. You know that the region is heavily affected by climate change, and uh, the governments are not up to the challenge mm. just because the challenge is too big. And in particular, in cities, the poor population is affected the most. Uh, what I would like to know is whether you do have micro, micro, micro entrepreneurs uh, from uh, urban slums coming to you with climate resilient solutions, what kind of solutions they are, and how do you think we could upscale this movement? Because I feel this is really needed. Yeah. One of the core thing about social business is to create a circular economy. So it's a part of our life to create a circular economy. One of the first priority is right now on building um, plastic. How to get rid of plastic. Can we achieve zero plastic? This is our theme. We just had a big conference in Ulsberg, Germany. We invited plastic companies also, negotiate with them how they are going to transform themselves into zero plastic direction or a circular direction, either way. Uh, so we had several uh, plastic companies participating with us. Uh, we have already demonstrated to them 10 rivers in the world. Eight of them are in Asia, two of them outside of Asia contribute 80% of the plastic waste ending up in the ocean. So if we clean up those 10 rivers, we could come to a level that we can control plastic. But un unless we can control the plastic producers. Because plastic producers keep on producing, then it goes again. So one of our first job right now, we are working in a project for the last two years, designing and finishing it up uh, in Vietnam to clean up Mekong River, which is not one of the 10, but Mekong River. We thought this is a manageable one that we can start and make sure Mekong River becomes free of all garbage and all plastic. And we are working with the many companies, many laboratories to make sure that this can be done. So it's not a simply a, a do-gooder's job. It's a, lots of science involved, lots of ideas involved. One is to recycle them into long-lasting plastic, which is the easier solution. Uh, and with the laboratories, we're talking about how to make biodegradable plastic. If it is possible, it's a challenge, you can make it. So many directions, just to give an example. Another one is we are working with the tire companies. Tire is a big polluter too. Millions and millions of tires. Only 7% of the tires in the whole world is ever used for any, for any other purpose after it's retired from its own job. Others are just thrown away. Imagine what happens to the world by that. 
So we are insisting on the tire company that they, they must find out with us or with themselves, whichever they find fit, to make sure 100% of the tires are recycled. Tire is a very interesting object. It's basically three elements in it. It's a, it's a rubber, which is a natural product. It's not plastic. It's a rubber. And lots of metals. Metals are always precious. And some chemicals, which burns. You can have fuels. You can have oils. So if you can create, divide it up, take it out its original shape to rubbers and metals and liquids, suddenly it becomes very attractive product. Today, only thing you, about the 7% we say, they chop them up into little pieces, use it for road construction, which is not a very good idea. So we are working with the scientists, with everybody else, to make sure rubbers can come back. So we are working with Michelin. We're working with Siet in India. We are working with Continental in uh, Germany so that we all work together to make sure this doesn't become pollution, create pollution, and create social business. This is something they have to do, not to make money, but to solve the problem they have created, and we all together created. So make sure. So these are the ways. It's, it's something, if you put it in your mind, it can be done. It's not something somebody else do. It's I do and you do. You have an idea. Share it with us, share it with somebody else, so that we can address those problems. Leaving it to the government, leaving it to some international agency doesn't do the job. It's us, are the people who will be living on this planet. We have to keep it safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I'm very sorry. We're going to have to close there. But can we give another massive round of applause to Professor Mahan Yunus? Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.